Amen. We're on a quest, a journey, a trip. Spiritually, some have been traveling this, this walk for a long, long time. Some not so long. Sometimes if we're honest, and we have to be honest, the Bible says don't lie. Lying is a sin. But sometimes we have this trip, this journey with enjoyment. It's fun. Sometimes there's a, some discomfort. And if we're honest, we've got to admit there's going to be discomfort. I, I really dislike, I, I won't say hate, but I, I really dislike when people say everything is going all the time okay because I'm a Christian. Because that's, that's a false narrative. That's, a, that's setting somebody up for failure. Because if, if you tell me that, that you're always on cloud nine spiritually, and I'm hardly ever there, something's wrong with me. That's the way I take it. So we've got to be careful. Sometimes we've been traveling with a lot of energy within. Sometimes, like I said earlier, it seems like a struggle just to get out of bed. But whatever we've seen, whatever we've experienced, this journey, although it's long, it is going to be worth every step we take. Not only when we see this destination, but more importantly, when we get to experience what there is to offer. Imagine with me, if you would, all the years, and for those of us who have been serving God or living for God for years, um, all the years of hearing the preacher, all the years uh, 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 of reading our Bible, all the times every time we sat down to study, all the prayers you have prayed, and when one day it's all going to be finished, it's all behind us. There's an old, old song. Uh, it's called Sweet Hour of Prayer. And the third verse says, Sweet Hour of Prayer, Sweet Hour of Prayer, may I thy con consolation share, till from Mount Pisgah's lofty height I view my home and take my flight. This robe of flesh I'll drop and rise to seize the everlasting prize and shout while passing through the air, Farewell, farewell. Sweet hour of prayer. We struggle today, and if you're in your flesh, we're all in our flesh, we struggle to pray. We struggle sometimes to live for God. We struggle sometimes to be there. But there's going to come a day when we're going to say goodbye. Amen. We're going to say farewell to prayer Farewell to the world and farewell to our troubles. What a day. Each time we put one step ahead of the other, amen, one, one day ahead of the other, we find ourselves closer and closer to that promised land. From the time Israel left Egypt to the time they crossed the Jordan River, their wandering in the wilderness was filled with hope and anticipation. That's what kept them going. Amongst the travel, the dreaded manna, the, the, the constant traveling, the, 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 the same old, same old, same old, there was something more important on their mind. They were seeking a promised land. And when they were looking for the, the land filled with milk and honey, they didn't know about it yet. They were striving for a place that Father Abraham had stepped into, and God said, this is going to be where my people are going to abide. Every step you take, I'm going to give that to your people. They were awaiting, and they were counting on receiving the promise. In Genesis chapter 13, verse 14, the Lord said to Abram, after that Lot was separated. Now notice, it wasn't with Lot because Lot was making a choice. And so after God dealt with the law issue, he said, lift up your eyes and from the place where you are northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land that you see to thee will I give it and to your seed forever. And I will make your seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise and walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it to you. For all the land... So then Abraham removed his tent and came to dwell and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. As Israel drew closer 
to the land. Amen. Amen. And they would have noticed some changes. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. They would have noticed some changes. And as the changes were taking place, anticipation would be growing within their mind. I wasn't there. I'm not that old. But I'm just going by what I would sense and I would feel. They, they was noticed that the terrain is changing now. Their surroundings were gradually growing different. The, gone were the things and the sights of the past. Before then, there were sights of the future. To those that dwelled where they were staying at that time or passing through, everything seemed normal just like it was yesterday. Everything would seem in place Everything would seem what we call normal. Every day would be like another day. Nothing would seem out of the ordinary. But to the child of God traveling through, in their keen sense, amen, of hope, things were not the same. As they drew closer to the promised land, the terrain changed from a fly, a fly, a dry, flat desert. Amen. Into hills and valleys. Amen. That the beginning to swell. Gone were the simple levels. Amen. The simple level plains that didn't take energy to cross. Amen. Gone were the easy steps. Uh, boring but easy steps. Now in the soft sand, the growing hills presented a level of difficulty they never experienced in a while. Amen. Climbing greater each day. They get on the top of the hill and have to go down the other side of the hill. Amen. And that same loose sand causing difficulty walking down. I believe it was Labor Day weekend that I took our Nigerian friends to Tomogamy and we went up to the tower. And uh, going up, my knees weren't so bad, but coming, and not up the tower, but just up the hill. But coming down, I had to take poor... Um, Oh, no, 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 Samuel. And I had to use him as a walking stick. Because sometimes walking down a hill is harder than walking up the hill. He was just at right height. So here's the children of Israel going up now and down these valleys. I don't know who I'm talking to. I know I'm talking to me. Amen. But, but somebody needs to hear this this morning. Because we're on a journey just like Israel was on a journey. We are on our way to a promised land. It's not a land filled with milk and honey. It's not a land, amen, with, with great people inside. They're gonna, we have to tear down walls like a, as of Jericho. Amen. It's not filled with giants that we've got to overtake. Amen. It's a promised land. There is a city. It's called the new Jerusalem. Amen. There there are walls, but they're made of pearl. Amen. Uh, sorry, Jasper. And there's a gate made of pearl. Praise God. And as we come closer to this goal, amen, to this great land, we draw closer to our anticipation, amen, the promised land to you and I. As we go on this journey and about this journey, we've noticed all around there's things that are different. As we journey, things are not the same as they were. Amen. The way seems more difficult. Amen. To those that live in this present world, it's the same old, the same old, and the same old. Amen. It's the same thing yesterday, today, and forever for them. They get up in the morning, they do their jobs, and they go home. And on the weekend, amen, they, they relax and they party and they celebrate to doing nothing. But they they go about their business as usual because they have no anticipation. They have no expectation and they have no hope. But we, let me say we, we who are traveling through, we know the difference. We're not here for a long time. We're not here for a good time. We are not settlers. We're just 
passing through. Do not listen to the naysayers. Do not listen to the people who are stuck behind. They're going to stay here. They don't want the promised land. They don't want what's coming. They don't want to see the new Jerusalem. They don't want to cross the Jordan River. They want to stay in the desert that's dry and bony where they were all their lives. They want to remain the way they are. But I want to be changed. I I want that moment. I want that twinkling of an eye. I want to be changed. I want mortality to come off. I want immortality to come on. I want to rise up and I want to meet Jesus in the air and I want to go home. I was talking to a friend of mine last week or a week and a half ago. He, he drove out west. He had rented a car and he's out west to, to see his family. Hey, man, I was, I was talking to him, and, and I said, when are you coming home? He just got there two days before. He said, brother, I wish I could leave tomorrow. I said, you just got here. He said, yeah, but I want to leave tomorrow. <laughs> when I go home, folks, there's not going to be no leaving home. Praise God. We're on a journey. We're sojourners passing through the land. We have someplace better to be. I said we have someplace better to be. We have someplace better to be. We've got someplace better to hope for. The best of this world is zero compared to the least of what we're going to get. Praise God. We notice the changes in the environment. Amen. We see the subtle adjustments. Amen. In the landscape around us. We notice the hills. Amen. Are becoming more difficult. We notice the valleys. Amen. Are, are deeper than ever, ever before. I've always taught and I've always lived and I've always lived for myself and expect myself. The more we serve God, the leveler I become. And that's so true. But the thing Things that come against us and the things we face are higher and deeper than ever, ever before. These changes at one time, as we drew, drew near to where we are today, they were just slight changes. They were just little things that we didn't pay attention to. They were just slight things that, that this caused us to see, and that's it. Now we are fasting and praying over these same things. Because they're not slight anymore. They're not little things. They're not inconvenient things. They're, they're not just uh, bumps in a road. These are valleys and these are mountains that we have to cross until we get to the finish line. Amen. These changes as we progress and we draw closer to home, the subtleness is quickly evolving, very, very quickly evolving into something. You ever heard the term making a mountain out of a molehill. You don't have to make it. It's there now. It seems like a blink of an eye and we wonder what happened. I don't know whether it was Thursday the men were talking. I don't know it was Wednesday talking to somebody after church. But, but we said, you know, we wondered how the world government can step in and control everybody. Well, a few years ago, we found out how they can control everybody. It didn't take long for them to shut everything down and bind everybody up. And that was just a test. Oh, no, not, no, it can't happen. It happened. Oh, no, something, it's got to be something more. No, it doesn't. It happened. At one time, notice yourself, and, and, and please, uh, if you agree with me, say amen. If you don't, that's fine. Uh, amen. But at one time, there was a simplicity in serving God. Now it's complex. Trying to win people, amen, bring them in. And I mentioned this years ago, a friend of mine was preaching, and he said at one time you could bring people in. Now their lives are like scrambled eggs. You cannot unscramble scrambled eggs. God can, but I can't, you can't. I can't figure out problems like now that we're facing in people's lives. They come and they tell me these things, and I just... 
And it's not enough to say God will, God will touch your life. God will bless you. God will help you. I know he will. But they, they're looking for an answer. They're not looking for, oh, come, God will heal you. God will do this. They're not looking for that. If, if I said this is what God's going to do in your life, uh, maybe that's an answer for them. But I'm sorry, I don't know what God ha has in plan for their lives. At one time, you could say, hey, listen, you just got to give up. And at one time, uh, people respected the church and ministry. People respected the things of God. People respected uh, uh, different things in the world. Forget church. Uh, they respected things in the world they wouldn't touch. Now those scrambled eggs are burning on the fry pan. At one time, leadership of a nation, of a people, uh, police and fire departments and, and pastors and teachers. Uh, I mean, you go into the school and the teachers are afraid to teach. Yeah. And it's not the kids. It's the parents. If I came home with a, with, with, with a note from the teacher, I never got the strap. Anybody ever hear of the strap? If I got home and I told my parents that I got the strap at school, I'd get it. I'd get it home anyways. I, I tell people in, in, in jesting, I know, but I grew up under the ministry of the belt. I do something wrong, and and, and my dad would just flick the belt, and that was enough. All my mother had to say was, wait until your father gets home. That was all. That was all. That was all. And I told this story. My mother came at me with a broomstick. And I was old enough to grab it from her. And I was old enough to snap it across my knee. And then I saw the fire coming out of her, knee, out of her eyes. And, I, and she didn't say, wait till your father comes home. I ran. <laughs> I say that jokingly now. And it sounds like my parents were terrible people. But let me share something with you that's very transparent on my part. Almost every time I got the belt... Believe it or not, I know you don't believe it. But I deserved it. My pastor told me, or told the church teaching, he said when those bubblegum bubble gum machines start turning behind you, talk with the police, and they pull you over, it's yes, sir, no, sir. They're not going to pull you over for something you didn't do. If perchance you didn't do it, you weren't speeding. It's yes, sir. No, sir. Because if you weren't speeding, there was times that you were speeding and you didn't get caught. Period. Gone are those days. I, I tried out for Metropolitan Toronto Police many, many, many years ago. I made it to the final interview. And in the interview, now this is 40 years ago. I was 19 or something. More than 40 years. Long time ago. <laughs> it wasn't in Bethlehem. <laughs> But one of the questions was, you go to a call, and back then, the police were two in a car. And you go into, get a call, and you go to this call. And as you're leaving the car, the radio comes on, and they got a question from where the last call you're at. Your partner goes in. And when you finish the call, you go in, 
and you look through the window and the gunman ha there's a gunman has a, a gun pointed at your partner. What do you do? And on the, you know, they don't want a 15 minute wait time. They just want you to automatic. So I just simply said, you aim to maim. Shoot to hurt the guy. This is Canada. And they said, it's wrong. I said, really? They said, yeah. The first, the line, the line of protection, number one, is the victim. Then it's the gunman. Then it's your partner. Then it's yourself. Now, the police in Toronto are telling people to leave their car keys on the porch so people will steal your car without going in and breaking into your house. In Florida, in Florida, somebody shot somebody, a thief, and the police were behind a podium and saying, we, you know, we know somebody got shot and died and said, so we don't know who did it, but if you did it, will you come? You're not in trouble. We want to give you some lessons on how to shoot. <laughs> See the difference? We're living in a society now that is with very liberal, and to overcome the liberal is very conservative. There's no middle ground. There's just opposite sides. I said all that to say this, that we are here in this world, and it's so confusing in this world. That we don't know half the time what's going on. You, you can't trust the media. You can't trust people because they heard a story and telling it like it's truth. So the Bible says we've got to be as harmless as doves, but wise as serpents. The Bible says the world is much smarter than us. What? But we got the Holy Ghost. I'm sorry. I'm losing touch with what's in the world because I'm trying not to associate with what's out there. That's where we're, at. we're seeing a change, a, a, a not so subtle change in the environment. So, hey, man, at one time it was simple serve God, but now it's like pulling teeth sometimes to serve God. Now we wonder what's going on around the next corner. We wonder what we're going to face. You know, I remember the younger days of serving God. It's like, I just look forward to tomorrow. I want to go home now. I don't care what the revival service is the next week. I want to go home. I, I, I care about the revival service. Don't get me wrong. We wonder what the future is going to bring. Our cry from hang on, Lord, just hang on another week, another year, Lord. And now it's even so. Come quickly. How many want the Lord to take place, uh, the rapture take place today? Hallelujah. <laughs> the sad part is we haven't reached that place yet. There's still a ways to go. I was telling somebody the other day, you know, as bad as things are, they could get a whole lot worse. Can you, okay, I, I want, we're doing an experiment here without, just an experiment. In your mind's eye, go back to those of us who have been serving God for 20 years or more. Put your hand up. Okay, go back in your mind. Did you picture the trouble of today? Did you think we'd get this bad? No, we didn't dream. And, and really, honestly, I'm just going to be honest here, it's not that bad. It's terrible. But I learned a lesson. I really learned a lesson. It could get a whole lot worse beyond my expectation and my desire and what I nightmare about. There's going to come a day, if the Lord should tarry, that we're going to look back at this complicated time and say, man, I wish we were there. Serious. One day, today's lifestyle is going to be seem simple and uncomplicated compared to the day that we're going to be in. 
We had this conversation a few days ago, how often we wish we can turn back time. Go back to the quote-unquote good old days. But you can't do that. I said this because I want to reiterate a fact that whatever is going to take place, the Lord does not do it without warning his people. Said through the prophet Amos, surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he reveals his secret to the servants of prophets. Once again, I don't know who I'm talking to. And if it's not you, that's good. I don't know who's feeling the weight of the world on their shoulder right now. I don't know who is contemplating giving up. But hear me, please, this morning. These things that are happening, the confusion, the troubles, the trials, are not here to cause you to stumble. They're not here to cause you to give up. They're not here to cause you to fall. But to show you the promise is on its way. The terrain is getting steeper. The hills are harder. <coughs> Excuse me. The harder to climb. The path is more covered. It means we're coming out of the desert. That's what it means. We're coming out of the desert. I mean, it means we're getting closer to home. It means we're, we're going to soon cross that spiritual Jordan River. Amen. Don't be discouraged by surroundings. Amen. Don't be dismayed by, by what you see. Don't be worried about the changes that you're, you're seeing around you. Look up and understand the day of the Lord is at hand. He is going to come and He is going to come very, very quickly. Amen. Again, I repeat myself. Signs of the times are everywhere. There's a brand new feeling in the air. This world even knows there's something coming up. Amen. But we know what's coming up. The world declares everything is good and will get better. We know not everything is good and not anything is going to get better. The world has been lulled amen, into a comfortable sleep, but we are or we should be wide awake and understand if I'm not wide awake today, open my eyes, Lord. Shake me, Lord, that I would see and, and maybe, I forget the Lord doing it, maybe I ought to shake myself. When you open up, and I'm not suggesting this, uh, you open up social media. You open up the news source. Uh, you, you open up your mind. Uh, wake up because signs uh, of the times uh, are all around us. Before we moved into North Bay, we were living, we were living on the East Coast, uh, amen, of Canada in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. Amen. And whenever we left the area to come back to Ontario for holidays uh, and we go back to home, uh, back to Blacks Harbor, we, we were right on the ocean. Uh, amen. We were living right on the ocean. And, and whenever we, we left for a period of time uh, and, and we turned around, went back home, uh, as we drew nearer to home, some Something was changing in the atmosphere. Amen. The physical atmosphere would change. Amen. The, the cool dampness, uh, amen, would, would begin to permit the car. Uh, the smell of the ocean and the saltiness, uh, amen, would begin to grow as you got closer. The temperature would shift. All would be more intense the closer we got to home. Spiritually. The church is the same. All we see, all we sense, all we experience are signs pointing to the fact we're going home soon. The road is harder to travel. The environment has changed and not for the better. The atmosphere is different. Amen. But this is what has been taking place. John the Revelator, he mentioned in his letter regarding the events of the coming of the Lord Jesus. And that's what the book of Revelation is, the revealing of Jesus Christ. This is what's going to take place before he comes. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11, and they overcame him. I want everybody to say this together. They overcame him. Come on, together. They overcame him. Oh, I'm going to do it again. One, two, three. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the 
death. The reason John wrote this was that God's people would be facing some hardships, amen, that would normally destroy them, but they had something. It was not a, it was not a secret weapon, but it was a higher power. It was a time of help in time of need. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb, just like the children of Israel. Remember the story. They're in Egypt. They're praying for deliverance. And God speaks and tells Moses, tell the people amen, to take a lamb and kill the lamb. Take the blood and put it on the doorpost and the lintel and the other side of the doorpost. And when the death angel comes by, it's going to pass over when it sees the blood. They overcame by the blood. We overcome by the blood. But John didn't write the blood only. He said, and by the word of their testimony. If you go into court and you are a witness to an event, the lawyer, the advocate is going to ask you, bro, would you come up to the stand? Brother Tim, would you come up? <laughs> Got to pick on somebody. This is the stand. Here's a jury. And here's a judge. And here's a lawyer. Okay, Tim, you were at such and such a place at such and such a time. Yes or no? Yes or no? <laughs> yes. Thank you. You got to be honest. Because now, now I know, I know not everybody wants to believe this, but when you're called to court, you're to tell the truth, truth. the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you, God. Okay, I know some people don't believe in laying hands in the Bible and saying that, but let's be honest, we're Christians. Shouldn't have to. Just tell, tell the truth, Tim. You were at this such and such a site, such and such time, correct? What did you see? And he goes through and tell he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> but he goes through and tells a story, right? That's his testimony. And so everybody's listening to his testimony. Because he was on site. And he saw everything. And he's telling the truth. And the other lawyer comes along and said, blah, 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 blah. And he said, I don't know. This is my testimony. That's all I know. I don't know what you're saying. Who are they going to believe? A lawyer who wasn't there or the testimony of an apostolic Christian? Thank you. You're off the stand. <laughs> John said this, that they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. That same blood, amen, by, by that same blood, we've been redeemed. Amen, that's our testimony. By that same blood and our obedience to the word of God, my sins have been washed away. Amen. By the power of God and the infilling of the Holy Ghost, I have power within me to live for God. Yeah, it took the blood, but also the blood needs my testimony because the blood, I'm sorry, is not good enough without the testimony. Oh, pastor, you're taking away the power of God. No, I'm not. Because the blood has been applied. But if I don't live the life, it's no good to me. It's like faith and works. Faith without works is dead. Show me your faith and I'll show you my works. I believe, so I believe. So I'm going to live the life I believe. This is my testimony. Why? Because I saw the event. I experienced it. I've got the, I cannot tell you how the blood worked. I did not feel the blood pouring into my life. But by faith, I stand before you with a testimony. The blood 
is the faith. Spilled 2,000 years ago at Calvary cannot be seen, but the evidence is in our cleansing and our life. Our testimony is the works. Our testimony is what people see. It's what people hear. It's what people experience in us. Somebody needs to hear this. It's not the same people that I was talking to earlier that's discouraged. They overcame by what? The blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. If my testimony is riddled with holes, my testimony is no good. Can I say it again? If my testimony, what I say, what I do, what I live, is full of garbage, it's not a good testimony about the blood. Let that settle. See, we can talk about the blood of the Lamb and the power of the blood, and we can talk about the redemption that we received and salvation we received, but if I'm not living the life, I have no way of overcoming. It's our actions that show that we're properly living for God. The brethren need to see it. Amen. God needs to see it to show him, Lord, I, 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 I claim the blood of Jesus. Oh, Lord, I got the Holy Ghost. Lord, I'm showing you these things. How? How are you showing me? Because you speak in tongues? No. By your lifestyle. You're showing God, Lord, I believe so much. Here's my lifestyle. I've changed my ways. I want to go home. This is all talk about going home on this journey. I've got to make sure I'm ready because we're getting so close to the end. And so i got to show God, this is my testimony because, Lord, you're going to put me on the stand and I have got can't let you down because the church, let me say the church, amen, my brothers and my sisters are watching my testimony. You know who else is watching? The world. Your mouth speaks, but your life lies. Come live for God. Well, you're not. Anybody could talk about blood being applied. Anybody can talk about Christianity. Anybody can, anybody can talk about living for God. We can't only talk about it. Let's go back in history. Children of God, hearing from Moses, take the lamb, slaughter it, and take the blood and put it in the doorpost. Hey, that's exciting. Yeah, you know, we, we got this answer. We got the answer to take the blood and put it, put it up, uh, on the doorpost. Woo, hallelujah, God's going to save us. And they don't do it. Or I think, I think it'd be better if I put it on the windowsill. It goes against that red, stinking old blood goes against everything that I want. It doesn't match the paint. Mm -hmm. I feel, I think it should be. I want this. Come on, you know where I'm going. If you don't put the blood on the doorpost and the door lintel, you ain't going to miss. Amen. You're, you're not going to have a, a firstborn that's alive in the morning because a death angel is going to stop at your door. But I knew I meant to. I don't care what you meant to do. Moses, 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 Moses. I, I meant to put the door, but I forgot. I was too busy. 
I had company, didn't want to offend them. They wouldn't understand. My children wouldn't understand. So I didn't do it because I love my children. I didn't want to hurt their feelings, didn't want to offend them. No, you didn't want to do that, but you offended God. And now you're on dangerous ground. John said they overcame by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony to the point that they no longer love their lives. One version says this, Rejoice, you heavens. No, wait a minute. Let's go back. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. That's how deep they were involved. That's how deep they were involved. They got to the point where, where they overcame by the blood. That's awesome. And by the word of their testimony, that's awesome. But you know what? They didn't stay there. They said, we're going to dig this hole just a little deeper. He said, I'm, we're not even going to love our lives. We're going to hate our lives. We're not going to look to, because when you do that, you are crucifying your flesh. It doesn't matter what I want. It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what my family thinks. It doesn't matter what my boss thinks. I must live for God. That's, what, that's why John's writing this. They overcame to the point. I don't have it here. That's what's going on. One version says this, our brothers conquered him, conquered the enemy. You can take your enemy as a devil, take the enemy as, as your, yourself or whatever, but talk about the devil here. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they did not cling to their lives even in the face of death. That's where they were. The scripture before this, verse 10 says, John, hang on. Where is it? It's not on here either. Who put this thing together? <laughs> verse 10 says this, I heard a loud voice from it saying in heaven, Now is come salvation, strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Then he said, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. I mean, I believe, every say pastor believes. It's okay, it's not doctrine, it's what I believe. I believe the closer we get to our final salvation, the more intense the enemy is going to become. Amen. So we need to be wary. Amen. He is accusing the brethren. Amen. Day and night. We can overcome by the blood of the Lamb, yes, and by the word of our testimony, and by denying our lives. That is why the spiritual terrain is changing. That is why there's deeper valleys and deeper hill, higher hills. That's why simplicity of serving God is turning more complicated complex. The accuser of the brethren is going day and night before God. He didn't care. He didn't care. Amen. Years ago because the ending was not yet. But it is now. And so the accuser is saying, Otis did this. Hey God, did you know that Otis did this? And God said, yes. And God responds with conviction in Otis's heart. And Otis responds to conviction. It's cleared up. But the accuser goes to God at the end time. And every little thing we do. Hey, you know what blessing did? Blessing disobeyed you. And so the Lord puts a conviction in blessing's heart, and blessing doesn't listen. 
See, when I accuse somebody of something, it means nothing unless it's true. So if I'm going to live for God, I better live for God. I can't just talk about living for God. I've got to live for God. Because there's somebody on my back. Amen. He's all around me all the time. Not the devil. He's got his angels. He's got his friends. You know, you know, you do something wrong and everybody finds out about it. Why is that strange? When you do something good, nobody finds out. Because nobody talks about the good things. They look for the trouble. And don't tell my wife I kicked the pumpkin. <laughs> See, the devil knows his time is short. He's out to tear you apart. Amen. He's out to destroy you. If you have the Holy Ghost, he can't do that except by way of your testimony now. He can't come against the power of God in you, but he can come against your testimony. So we've got to keep ourselves on the road. We've got to focus on the attention of the goal. And we need to, to zone ourselves, amen, uh, not only in what the Lord has done in our lives. We can, we can live in the past all we want. But folks, we've got to get to the present. It doesn't matter what I did for the last 30 years. It matters what I do now till the end. The devil, if he's accusing you of something, amen, it's his testimony against your testimony. Amen. And if your testimony is more powerful than his testimony, he doesn't have one. Doesn't mean he's telling the truth to God. It just means he's, he's a liar. And he's accusing the brethren and the sisters. He can't destroy the testimony when you apply the blood. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus that washes white as snow. It reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley. The blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never, ever lose his power. There's nothing he can do about the blood. I'm sorry for him. But do not let your testimony be destroyed. Don't let the power of your life be taken over. Don't let him have his will and his way with you. It's not worth it. Folks, I I'm going to be straightforward. We're too close to the goal. We're too far along in this journey. We can see the end. We're almost there. Can you sense it? Can you anticipate it? Can you feel it? Again, signs of the times are everywhere. There's a brand new feeling in the air. Hallelujah. I tried. Every time, I, I don't fly very much now. But over the years, I, I've flown quite a bit. And just trips and stuff and nothing major. But every time I'm on an airplane, I try to figure out how many airports I went through. In my head. It takes hours because I keep forgetting. But I was thinking yesterday, I guess I, want, I need to go on another trip somewhere. I want to fly somewhere. <laughs> but on an airplane, the staff does not prepare you to disembark from the airplane when the airplane comes to the terminal. They don't begin to take care of the, of the passengers and instruct them while you're on the runway landing. You're miles away from the airport and they come over the loudspeaker or they walk along, put your bags away, put your stuff away, put this away, put your seatbelt on. We're, we're landing in 15 minutes. We're landing in half an hour. We're about to, we're about to land, whatever it is. They don't wait till they're there. Say, okay, everybody, put your stuff away because we're getting off the plane now. It's too late. If something goes wrong on landing, they lose a wheel and they crash. They don't want bags flying. My wife, a few years ago, was flying down to New Brunswick. Flew from, from Toronto. 
the coolest thing happened. Got all the way to Fredericton, where she was supposed to land, and the plane turned around, went to Quebec somewhere, because they had a hydraulic issue. So why doesn't that stuff ever happen to me? I enjoy it too much. <laughs> but they didn't tell the people it's okay, just sit around, do nothing. While they're flying in the air, folks, we got to tell you something. We have to go back to, I think, Quebec City or Montreal. I'm not sure. Let's say Quebec City because for some reason. We have to go back to Quebec City. And when we get there, you're going to notice something, so don't be worried. On the runway, there's going to be fire trucks and ambulances awaiting our arrival. The better thing to do is stop the worry and not tell people. But when it happens, they want people to be aware. I said all that to say this. The Lord is coming. And time to get ready is not when the trumpet sounds. It's time to get ready. It's not, to, amen, that five minutes before and you don't know there will be some who will cry out at that time and it'll work. They'll be prepared that fast. But there's others who won't. Are you ready? Should the Savior call today? Would Jesus say, now don't, don't look into the future. Don't look two weeks from now. Look at right now. Look at this moment. Take a snapshot. Kenneth? Clara? Take a snapshot of the right now. Are you ready right now if the Lord says it's done? Would he say, well done? Or would he say, you didn't make it? You see, we're on this journey now, but there's going to come a day when the journey's over and there will be no more travel and no more preparation and no more getting ready. Let's stand. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how many years you've been serving God. It doesn't matter how many hours you spent in prayer. It doesn't matter how many days you fasted. I'm going to get, ask every one of us to come to the front. Well, Pastor, I can pray back here. You can. But you know what? It's more effective if you come to the altar. It's a stepping out of your comfort zone. Would you come this morning and pray? Make sure, make sure you're ready for the journey in Jesus' name.